Okay, welcome everyone to the August 2022 meeting of Biomaker Developers in Southern California, FM DISC. Um, we are very pleased to be joined this morning by Steve Romig and Robert Holsey from Clarence. And we're gonna dive into the presentation. Um, they're gonna be showing us sort of what's new and then we'll be uh, opening up to questions in a sort of ask me anything style uh, question and answer. So uh, Robert, the uh, floor is yours, welcome. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. And, and hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, when I walk through this, uh, you know, I, I, I would encourage folks if you have questions as I'm talking about something, just if you want to raise your hand or, or speak up and unmute, I'm, I'm totally good with that. Uh, you know, this is more conversational than me doing a presentation. Uh, as I was saying earlier, you know, over the last uh, really through this summer, right? We, we've had a number of touch points through the community as well as pushing out updates to the product. Uh, so you've seen Studio, if you've been following along, mature pretty rapidly here as we head into uh, September. We have been talking about, uh, you know, when we first launched Studio, uh, you know, we talked about it as, you know, sort of our first skateboard and uh, talked and demonstrated examples of leveraging the new form capabilities to do data collection. Uh, over the last couple of months, uh, we've uh, pretty drastically expanded that to include some additional uh, view types. Uh, and now what you're seeing on screen here, the concept of hubs to gather those views up and then share those with users. Uh, the other thing that's been going on is more tightly integrating with uh, the Claire's Pro product line. Uh, so in this most recent release that we did on, on August 9th, I believe, uh, we not only introduced some enhancements uh, in the form of hubs and a couple of other uh, view types on the studio side, we also introduced uh, uh, bi-directional or CRUD actions from the Claris Pro side of things. So what I thought I would do is give you a real quick tour of uh, where studio is today. Um, I'm always pleasantly surprised as I was getting ready for this meeting, I logged in and kind of poked around a little bit. I am on our QA environment. Uh, so. Uh, be aware that uh, I might run into an issue here or there. Uh, but the thing that is cool is every day I'm seeing enhancements to the visuals and new features getting checked in. Um, so I might get a little bit of a surprise as I'm going through this along with all of you. Um, what you're seeing on screen here again is uh, after I've logged into Studio, I'm looking at the hubs. It's, I haven't created any hubs yet, but I have created some views. So we're gonna actually start on the view section. And, and you'll see here that I, I've got uh, quite a few. Um, in this is the demo environment that I had used for auto enter and, and so what I had put together uh, are a series of views that help support a, an app that we actually have in Claris Pro for tracking events right so I've got my core you know Claris typical Claris Pro app layout here to go in under the hood uh, we'll see that we've got some tables but most of the tables are actually uh, coming from Claire Studio. So in fact, if we look at the layout, we've got our registration tab here. This is all data that if I go over into the web browser, I can see in this spreadsheet view in Studio. Uh, one of the things that, um, uh, again, we just introduced with in the August 9th release is that bi-directional updating. Uh, so we've got uh, Gary in here. The example I gave was uh, maybe he registered for the event, uh, put in the incorrect email address so we can come in here and actually solve that for them from Pro. So I'm making it something dub base when I tap out of here. Uh, now this won't happen automatically yet. Uh, we are working on uh, product uh, notifications across products. So meaning as I make record changes on the studio side, having it automatically update on the client side for Claris Pro. That's still coming, but at the moment, uh, it will, will require you to do a refresh. Uh, but you can see here when I search for that user, we have actually updated that record here. Now, the spreadsheet view is one of uh, a few that we're providing here. Uh, if I come back to my uh, you know sort of traditional Claris Pro app, not only am I collecting registration information, but I've also got some to-do items that I need to do. I've got some purchase requests. Uh, and then ultimately this all rolls up to some results after the event is over and we've gotten some donations and uh, feedback on how the, the folks enjoyed the event. Uh, and while these are you know, super useful uh, doing this in, in Claris Pro, doing certain actions uh, are oftentimes uh, 
uh, better facilitated through a web browser uh, through views like a Kanban view. Um, so here's an example of those three actions that I have here. I can show that same data showing in studio, drag these elements around and then have that update uh, for my users that are coming in through Claris Pro. The ideas, uh, the the idea of Studio, and I hope this has come across in the many sort of touch points, whether that's through the community or through uh, YouTube videos that we post or videos that uh, Roadmake uh, creates, is really to extend the platform, right? So as you can see in this example, it's not either or; it's leveraging the strengths of each product. You're going to have users that you know it just makes more sense for them to be in a classic environment, you know, running on a. And when I mean classic, I don't mean old, I mean like the way that we're used to doing it inside of a native client accessing the, the data. Maybe you're a back office person, uh, you're in this every day, there's a lot more functionality behind this app than maybe I'm looking at on the screen and it's just part of it. But then I may have other people in the organization that you know they're not in Claris Pro every day, uh, they just need quick access to data. So for example, we've got uh, those results that are being collected. So maybe I wanna come in here and let's see, I've got my, uh, so here's the results of that uh, of this program that I'm doing. Maybe I want to surface a dashboard for my team to see um, the uh, results of what's coming in so far. So I could do that in a couple of ways. Uh, so in this uh, spreadsheet view, uh, maybe I want to create a quick chart uh, looking at sort of how people are feeling. Um, and I can change the view to different view types uh, or quick uh, chart types, I should say. And let's say this looks good to me. From here, I can actually go and convert that, create that as a dashboard. And this gives me sort of a starting place. And then of course I can go in here and add, maybe we wanna add some summaries. Uh, so this is the total number of donations that have come in. Uh, maybe I want to add, let's do a, another chart here. And uh, you know this tells us how many donations came in as an example. The, uh, the last view uh, I'll touch on real quick uh, for those who haven't seen it. I think I've got one in here already. Do I? Oh yeah, this uh, purchase requests. So let's go ahead and look at a list detail here where uh, just like a form, if you've played with Studio or you've seen Studio before, or you just saw on the dashboard, I can move these things around and position the sort of detail view, uh, whichever way works best for me. Uh, but out of the box, I get this search area, the ability to sort and filter, and I get the um, sort of list of records here on the left. I can customize this to a degree, go in and you know show whether or not titles are there and pick what fields I want the data to come from. But then if I go and publish this, let's go over and show a link here. So you can actually see this in action. As I navigate through these records, uh, you can see that automatically changes the records for me and I can go in here and process these. The other nice thing about this is um, much like if you saw with the forms, uh, we made them responsive. So depending on the window size or device size, they reflow. We've done the same thing here. So as I shrink this down, um, where it no longer makes sense to be in a list detail, it becomes a list. And when you click on one, it drills down into the detail. And then obviously we've got some navigation to go back. Um, one thing to call out in all of this, you are seeing some really stuff. We're continuing to iterate. So I'm, I'm, as you're seeing things that, you know, maybe don't make sense to you or you'd like to see differently, uh, that's definitely feedback we'd want to hear along with the reasons why, like, you know, what, what uh, use cases you have for it. Um, but for this particular example, again, you can drill into the record uh, and you get that navigation automatically. So those are a quick tour of the, the views that we're currently shipping. These again are all in the um, uh, build available today. UI might look slightly different. Again, I'm seeing a, a, the latest cutting edge from engineering, uh, but those are the different view types. Hey, Pause hey, here Robert. for a second, any questions? Yeah, I, I have a quick question. Um, if you could just go into a little more detail on the sort of the options in this view management window, I see the like you know the three little dots and there was a pop up menu, and then there's sure. just uh, just to walk us through what the functionality is here. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, for some of these, you'll see that we have started sharing these, so that this is clear that this is something shared publicly. Um, the uh, icon here is just telling you more information about you know when it was created, what type of view that it is. And then you can go through and obviously edit the name. This is also something you can do in line here. 
Uh, you can modify whether it's you you have your sort of publicly shared link, but at any point, you know, maybe I, I'm done with this. I don't want this accessible to folks any longer. I can go turn that on or off. Um, and then depending on the view, you can actually create additional views from it. Uh, and this is something we're still working through. You can see here for this list detail, I can create a spreadsheet from it. Uh, for a spreadsheet, I can go and create a form or a list detail or a Kanban for it. Um, again, this um, is something that we're sort of experimenting with, trying to understand or trying to convey the relationship of a view and its underlying data. Unlike FileMaker, where you are sort of forced into that context of a layout has a specific table uh, tied to it, making things like when you want to do or would like to do, I should say, uh, nested views where you've got a view that has data being pulled from a bunch of different sources like that. That's difficult to do today in, in Claire's Pro. Uh, our you know, target for these views is that we don't have that same sort of binding at the moment we do. Uh, you know, these individual views, when you create a new view, will create a uh, corresponding uh, entity or a table behind it. Uh, but the reason you're seeing us do things like this and not expose the table structure is that we're trying to get to a point where these are much more free. And for a particular view, I can mix and match data to solve whatever challenge I'm, uh, I'm looking to solve. At the moment, uh, in these builds, uh, there's no way to organize these yet. So there's no way to filter these views or, or search for them. You know, those are things that we're absolutely going to be working on. Uh, we're starting off small again, iteratively. Um, one way, though, that you can group these views into something meaningful uh, is the hubs, which we'll talk about next. Uh, but before I move on, did that get at the question around sort of what you're seeing on the screen? And is there any other questions around views? Yeah, that was very helpful. Um, see if anybody else has, has questions on this on this topic. If you, if you do, feel free to unmute yourself. I think we have a small enough group that we can we can manage it that way without having to go through putting up hands. So hey, hey, Robert, maybe I'm just mm -hmm. too deeply uh, <laughs> steeped in FileMaker, but when you said uh, uh, we have a difficulty in uh, in the pro version of seeing uh, stuff from multiple sources, uh, my brain went, mm -hmm. well, I, I can, what, what can't I do? Uh, but maybe yep. I have blinders from doing it for too many years. Um, can you t tell me what I can't do? <laughs> Yeah, I should have said it slightly differently. So th there's sort of two parts. There's um, the scenario where you have, let's say, the desire to do what we, a lot of people refer to as the nest layout, right? Where you'd want to have on a single, that's called a view page, what have you, you've got different sections of that um, layout that is being pulled from completely different contexts. Now, there are ways to do that. Uh, tricks that people have come up with, uh, but it is oftentimes a, a pretty big hurdle to understand how to set up a, a layout that's pulling data from not only data, but like actual views. Like if I wanted to have something in pro today where let's say the header section of my uh, layout was consistent across a whole bunch of different pages. Yeah, there's things you could do like web viewers that are embedded or tricky things with button bars. Um, but it, it really is still, you're sort of taking data and reassign it, you know, realigning it with the context that that layout is based off of. Uh, the other thing is when you want to create, you know, the more traditional putting data on a, on a single thing is through portals and you've got to relate that data. Um, with the way that we're building this, um, you won't have to go first and create the relationship in order to then create a view that has all that different data on it. Um, so it's a little hard to explain it in the abstract, but I think as you see us continue to iterate on these views, it, it'll make more sense. Um, what we're trying to get to is a point where I know as a longtime developer on the FileMaker side, there's absolutely been cases where um, I felt constrained, I guess is the best word, in the fact that my layout had to be tied to a specific tables, um, to a specific table, uh, you know. In the new world, we're hoping to get to a place where I've got a view and I could be showing data easily from a bunch of different places and it's filtered and it's related to what I'm looking at, but I don't have to go through and understand our database relational model and create additional table occurrences just for the point of displaying the data. Did gotcha. that help answer the question or was that more confusing? No, that absolutely. <laughs> Which is fair. 
it, okay. sort of um, what we uh, at one point referred to as uh, what was it sub sub layouts or something mm -hmm. like that. You can just yeah, sort of that's another word I've heard yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And again, where we are today is because we're you know we're, we're we're starting from what we know and what, you know what sort of the simplest fast forward is, which is a a view as we're calling them here is tied to the entity underneath. Um, but but that's not the end all be all. That's not where we want to stay long term. Cool. Any other questions on views? Just a quick general follow up. So you mentioned about this bill being accessible. I assume that's currently still to people in the problem solver circle and maybe platinums, but not to the general developer community at this point. Is that correct? Uh, that it's either the problem solver circle uh, or the new Claris platform bundle that we uh, released a, a few weeks ago as well. Um, but there at this point isn't a general availability for just anyone want to come like a trial or something like that to come and kick the tires. Uh, we're working rapidly towards that um, and hope to have that available soon. We want to get this into as many people's hands as possible. Uh, but the current paths at the moment are through the problem solver circle or Claris platform bundle options. Great, thanks. Yep. And one thing to, to call out there, you know, I, I touched on it earlier, but we're at a cadence now where we're launching something about every three weeks, um, not exactly, but roughly. Uh, and so folks, especially over the over the last month, uh, has seen these enhancements coming pretty rapidly. And we've got another one just in a couple of weeks again that we have planned. So uh, for those that do want to get in and are looking for, uh, you know, you're already at a point where you need to renew anyway, and you're looking at a, at a different licensing model, uh, or want to get ahead of the game and start getting uh, either yourself or your customers into that so that you can have access to this stuff early. Um, those are a couple of options. Um, okay, I'm going to come back uh, to hubs in a second. Actually, I want to show one other thing is the, the users here. Uh, so at this point, it's still um, very simple manager or member, a manager is going to see this entire interface that you're seeing here. Uh, a member will see just the things that are shared with them through the hubs. Um, so showing you that just so you can see that I've got a couple of managers uh, and then a bunch of members. So if I go into my hubs view, this is where I can start taking and gathering those views up and sharing them uh, with members of my team. Now, this is this is a concept that has been a little tricky for folks um, internally as well as we've been kind of thinking about what's the easiest way to surface data within an organization and get people to to that data as quickly as possible. Uh, what I see, and I imagine many of you see, is that you've got users of a system like this um, that really only need one or two pieces of that. And so one of two things need to then happen. Either you as the developer have gone in and special case, okay, well, when Steve Robnick logs in, ignore all of my normal opening script stuff, take them direct, take him directly to this layout. Um, or you're putting the burden on Steven to go, to, or Steve to go in and say, okay, I launched this app, I click on this menu item, on this menu item, like that button, and then this button, and then, then I've got the view that I need. And so with uh, studio, we're trying to make it really easy for you to take a view uh, and bundle it up for a particular user um, so that they can focus on what's relevant to their job. Uh, this is similar to an app concept. You know, the difference really being that it, with an app, your schema, your layouts are all tied to that app. And if you want to reuse that, those layouts or that schema, you all know the fun that that is to, to go through to link those two those two apps together. So with hubs, we're really trying to make it much more freeing. I can take in a single view uh, and put it in multiple hubs alongside other views that are particular to that user's function. So to give you an example here, right, tying it back to uh, where's my app here? Uh, you know, maybe I've got a, a team member that's you know doing the the tracking the events and and handling the purchase requests. Uh, so I could create a new hub here and call it events. <coughs> And I could go and add those views specifically. Um, here's another surprise and delight moment. I, I had not seen the version that has the thumbnails actually working. So that's cool. Um, okay, so in here, maybe we wanna do the purchase requests. And what was the other thing I said? The, where's the Kanban view? Oh, this one here, the event to do's. So I can select those two, add them together. And now I have that view and I can go in and add some members. I'll add my um, user account that I got and we'll open up here in a moment. Um, you know, and when I log in, you'll see that instead of seeing all of this view, I will see just these options. 
And then maybe I create another view for the results. <clears throat> and this is the dashboard and uh, maybe they want to spread the spreadsheet view itself. And I can go in here and add some other users here. Um, options wise, you can go in here and edit the hubs. You can delete the hubs uh, from each of these as a team manager. I can open it. I can edit the view. I can preview the view. Oh, and that last one is a delete. Um, let me open up uh, Chrome and we'll go to this as the end user so you can see what that looks like. <clears throat> Okay, so as I log in as the end user, um, I'm not seeing all of the additional uh, app Chrome that would let me go in and manage users or anything like that. I just get my hubs and clicking into each of these, I can see my views that were shared with me. So this makes it super easy for me to uh, surface to users that, again, aren't living in Claris Pro every day, um, that you don't wanna have them go through the, the uh, web direct experience. You just need to surface this data it's coming through your Claris Pro app uh, or being submitted directly through Studio and easily share it with those users. I'll pause here again, uh, and then I've got one more thing I just want to talk through, but it isn't so much of a demo. A any questions or thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I have a I have a question. Um, yep, go for it. Have these have these hubs and this concept of hubs and, and the, the kind of the way that, that everything is arranged now, has that taken the place of the workflows that we saw early on, those linear workflows that, that were nope. part of um, it? Do I, I think I've got one, is this one? So we still have these. Uh, these are specific to okay. the uh, forms today currently. Um, mm -hmm. And at the moment, hubs are just single pages. Now, if I added, uh, I shouldn't say it that way, Hubs do not yet have sort of the full end and sort of, I don't want to say app navigation, but let's say app workflow um, just yet. That is something that we're building towards the idea that, you know, you share a set of views in a hub, but you can then build on top of it logic on, you know, when you click on something, navigating to another view uh, or having multi stage sort of processes like, okay. You know, maybe for a purchase uh, request approval, it's more than just going through and saying yes or no. Maybe that's the first step, and then it goes and sends it to someone else. They've got to come in and uh, take action on it. Or maybe I do the first step and um, saying accept, and then it takes me to another view to go and do the actual purchasing. Like all of those kinds of actions are things that we're working on. But at the moment, so like, it, oh, good. No, so I was gonna say, like, like you know, my my first reaction the first time I saw the workflows was kind of where's the conditional branching, which I think is really yep. what you're you're talking about there, and 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 so so you're you're talking about building that kind of thing into it so that we can have more complexity. Absolutely. So process. one of the things, even outside of hubs, when we talk about this registration form. Um, you know, we we already know we've we've gotten great feedback from the community, people that have already started leveraging Studio or have at least kicked the tires and want to use Studio uh, for doing data collection like this, that we need to introduce things like branching paths, both at the at the sort of page to page layer. So you could imagine, uh, you know, not only could I maybe add a view here in between these two sections, I could add some conditional and say, you know, uh, let's say that my registration was for a camp and the person signs up for a swimming class. Well, by doing that, then I need to have route that person to an additional page that is a waiver to say if your child drowns, we're not responsible, right? That kind of thing. The other bit of branching that we're looking at is within a page. So maybe I go in and, um, you know, say, hey, I, I, I opt in, I want swag sent to me as a drop down. That would then show this section. All right, so those are a couple of things that we're we're looking at aren't built yet, but absolutely know that are, are critical for many use cases. Thank you. Hey, Robert, I see some questions in the chat. I don't know if you want uh, oh sure just to, to review them or I can read them out to you, whatever you prefer. Um, I, I can go through them here. Um, so uh, there was one here about, will there be the notion of versioning of these views uh, so you can roll backwards and forwards? Um, absolutely, we're not there yet. Um, uh, 
uh, there's a, a good bit of um, benefit we get uh, from using Mongo as a backend for the data storage that will help us get to a point of rolling back and forth. Um, but there is absolutely work that we need to do to facilitate that. Uh, but absolutely, just not there yet. Uh, are there plans to eventually, uh, or, or sorry, are there eventual plans to support a DDR-esque metadata export for Studio? Um, when I say, so the, the, the versioning thing, I, I can see that as being something that we want to tackle in the not too distant future. Uh, to do a DDR-esque uh, metadata, we're not absolutely not against it. It would be all in the use cases um, and understanding what you're trying to accomplish and why, uh, because we may be solving what you're trying to do in a slightly different way. Um, and so I don't want to say, yeah, DDR is something that we're thinking about. Um, it's more about understanding why we're looking for that and making sure that we're solving that in the best possible way. Um, let's see. I saw there was a couple more, but I'll come back to those. Uh, you sound they, like uh, me talking to my clients. This is going to be great, <laughs> but it's not built yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, so the, 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 one of the biggest takeaways I hope that we're, we're conveying in all these touch bases and, and in, in the presentations that we were doing, when we, when we look at Studio, understand two things, right? It, it's not aiming to go out and replace FileMaker as FileMaker exists today, right? This is really an extension of the platform, more, more tools for your toolbox um, that are, it's gonna be just better at solving certain things than FileMaker is today. And I think data collection is a perfect example of that. You know, surfacing dashboards is another great example of that. The other thing is that Studio carries the same spirit of FileMaker, of Claris, right? So a lot of the things that you, you all are asking about are things that we know that we need because we have 35 years of experience of those needs. Um, now, are we going to do everything exactly like FileMaker? No, we're going to look at this differently. And that's why I say things like the DDR, you know, I... I would be surprised if we implemented it exactly like we did in FileMaker. I think that there's going to be opportunities for us to better solve the challenges of where why we're asking for the DDR. And that's why you'll hear me say, and, 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 and folks from my PO team, we're always going to be asking why. So when you ask a question like that, the more that you can give us, and we don't have to do it right here, right now, you guys have my email address, um, and we're, we're setting up uh, listening channels so that we can get this feedback on a more uh, um, structured basis. But understanding that that use case is super key here. Um, so then the next one here was about uh, full branding, top on top banner, uh, text footer, et cetera. Uh, yeah, so again, this is something that where we're starting at is making sure that we create something that looks great out of the box. Uh, you've probably heard me talk about this or say something along these lines in the past about one of the things that I love about FileMaker, one of the things that I know the community loves about FileMaker, which is that it allows you to build anything. Uh, I think the double-edged sword there, though, is that you're forced to build everything, right? So, you know, when we look at that list detail, um, I can create that in seconds here with all that base functionality that just to get to that base in the FileMaker world uh, would take me a good bit of time. Uh, to give you a practical example, again, I'm sure many of you have heard this, but it's real. Uh, we use our products internally. I am... Uh, I run the internal employee AMAs that we do. Uh, and part of that was creating a way for employees that you know maybe don't feel as comfortable getting up and asking questions um, to submit questions that I could ask on their behalf. And so I had to create a, a pretty simple form, three fields, you know, a, a optional name, who they're asking the question of, and then a required uh, question section. Um, I needed it to be accessible for people that may not have Claris Pro installed because they're in our finance departments or, you know, some department that doesn't need to be in FileMaker all the time. And I wanted it to look great and I wanted it to be able to work across different device sizes. Now, on the surface, that seems pretty straightforward. Um, I'm a longtime developer. I, I can I know how to do that. But even having the understanding of what I needed to do took me. Uh, about 48 minutes, uh, almost 50 minutes to build uh, from start to scratch. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, so then, you know, we deployed that. It worked well for us for a bit. But as soon as we had an, uh, a version of Studio that we could leverage to solve that problem, I rebuilt same requirements and it took me four minutes. Um, and the end result was actually 
be much more better. It was much better feeling. I mean, it had um, uh, true responsiveness as it was being just, you know, uh, displayed on different devices. Um, the interactions were just snappier and felt more modern. So for a fraction of the time, I was able to get something built and deploy to our team that just felt better. And, and you're going to see a lot of those kinds of things here, tying it back to the initial question of the branding, right? What we want to make sure that we do first is great, create these things that look great, that work the way that you expect and do, let's say, 90 percent of what you want so that you're then focusing your energy on just that last 10 percent. And so what you'll see here is us starting to build on top of this, the ability to go in and customize the look and feel, um, maybe not to the exact degree that we did on FileMaker, the pixel precision, because then there's trade offs on you know, our ability to go and create something, you know, from right out of the box, it works well, uh, but absolutely things like styling, um, you know, starting to layer in uh, the ability to automate through scripting and or the equivalent of scripting here. So all those things are coming and, and absolutely something that we know is key to this platform maintaining that spirit. Uh, let's see, uh, what else? Uh, could hubs be rebranded for the users? Same same kind of answer there. Um, at the moment, um, it, it just is called hubs, but we know that it, it, we, we want to be able to put uh, your own company branding on this so that when they come to that page, that sort of home section feels like it belongs with either your company or your, cu your customer's company's uh, branding. Uh, can Clear Studio have used format numbers, rate align, and with the appropriate decimals? Um, yeah, so we do have some options there. It's not to the degree that FileMaker has today. Uh, I can now sound like a, a broken record here, and I apologize, but use cases, use cases, use cases. Uh, that really helps us un uh, understand that we're making the right choices on how we solve those problems, and of course, prioritization. Uh, let's see, there was a couple of additional questions that have come in. Uh, Howard had, uh, can you show what the studio data looks like in pro? Uh, is it like any other external data or is it more like internal pro data would look? Uh, can fields be added from pro? Uh, does the relationship graph? Okay, yes, I can absolutely do that, Howard. Um, so please do understand this is, again, just like we're talking iteratively on the uh, studio side in a web browser, this is going to continue to iterate as well. Um, the way that this looks uh, today is much like ESS would work if you're familiar with that. Uh, so down to the fact that, you know, italicized text um, in the table view, just like a MySQL table would show up, uh, we call out what the data source is. Um, from a fields, uh, let's go into one of these, uh, from a fields perspective, uh, you don't have the ability to add at this point uh, fields directly to the studio schema. That is something that um, we're considering, we wanna look at. Uh, of course, the challenge there will be that it's not, it's not clear yet if we bring over 100% of what Pro has. Um, and I mean that more specifically around how calculation summaries and containers work. Obviously, we've got text, number, date, time, timestamp on the studio side. Um, we do have, I, I didn't show it here. Um, this has been in the release a little bit now, the ability to add attachments uh, for uh, images, which will, will render actually in studio and then of course file types. Right now it is limited to, I think five megabytes, so fairly small. So we've got some growth to do there. Um, and containers have a ton of options that we need to look at and evaluate what makes sense there. Similar for calculations, how we translate that to how we handle calculations on the studio side, same with summary. Um, so it, in the meantime, just like studio, I mean, I'm sorry, just like ESS tables, you can add additional calculation summary fields um, uh, to this schema, but that those would not be uh, accessible yet in the studio side. Uh, from the relationship side, um, they show up just like any other table occurrence. Um, you'll see here that I am. Uh, this is a built earlier when the relationships weren't fully working. I can go in and fix this now so that we can expose the primary keys and and uh, things of that nature to better relate to relate these. But as far as the sort of how you'll interact with them, it, it's very similar to how you would an ESS table today. Um, oh, I don't think this is actually in this build. I don't have this yet. One of the other things. Yeah, it's not in here yet. So one of the other things that we are working on is um, the ability to take a uh, table that's in FileMaker. We refer to that as a Draco table for those who haven't heard that term, but a Draco table uh, and start migrating those over to Studio. Um, so as an example, maybe I created this 
this you know Claire's Pro app, and I already had a registration table uh, for gathering uh, folks you know that are signing up. Uh, so I've already got some data in there. But then I want to create a form in Studio uh, to start collecting the, you know my next round of uh, um, registrations. So what you would be able to do is actually in the managed database, select a table and have that migrated up to Studio. Uh, what that would do is take that table schema, push that to Studio, take that data, push that to Studio. Uh, so now that would all be stored in Studio's backend and then swap out the table locally uh, with one of those um, shadow tables, uh, if you've heard it called that before, but essentially an external table. Uh, we're starting, um, this is will hopefully be in a release not too distant future, um, very simply with tables that are just text number timestamp, I think, um, and understanding that that's going to not, that's going to leave out a whole bunch of use cases. It's just our first step, just to start getting something out there. We've got more work to do as we look at calculations. Obviously, we don't have calculations on the studio side yet, so we've got a bit of work to do there. Uh, but you'll see us start to make it easier for you where it makes sense to move that data from Draco over to studio. Completely understanding. And this is really part of the magic here that there's going to be use cases where Draco tables just make more sense and that you don't have to move everything over. Uh, and there's a, some real potential for us as we look out even further of having that mixed world where some data you're, you're leveraging the power of, in this case, Mongo as a back end. Um, and uh, Chris Moyer and Richard Carlton had a great uh, live session on that, I want to say two weeks ago or so, where more really drove into the potentials of Mongo. Um, not saying that we'll, uh, you know, Go and do every one of the things that he talks about there. Um, but again, that's where understanding what's interesting to you and what you're seeing there, where you think you can apply that and what those use cases would be. Uh, again, all prioritization game and understanding the best way to solve those. Uh, there was another question that just came in. Uh, will Studio Mongo be served by server? Um, not sure I follow that question exactly, Ethan, uh, but I will say that um, what you're seeing here is Claris Pro. Uh, in exchanging that data. Um, what we have coming uh, very soon is a version of server and go. Uh, server is really gonna be key uh, because it's, you know, like it does today, it acts as the hub of a lot of organizations, it's pulling data from a bunch of different sources. Uh, and it will be able to also connect to Studio and do the CRUD exchange, uh, likewise, uh, Claris Go. And then a little bit further out, uh, bringing this to Claire's cloud so that if you're hosted in the cloud, you have access to bi-directionally to the studio data. Um, Ethan, I don't know if that answered your question, if you want to unmute or if you want to expand, um, but sort of building off of that, I do have a quick diagram I wanted to just talk through. Um, what you've heard us talk about uh, at these different sessions uh, really is uh, sort of highlighted by this. This is something we put together early on. Um, that should look pretty familiar to, to many of you, right? You've got some Claris Pro app hosted by FileMaker Server and data is being stored in Draco. And, you know, it's acting as a hub. It's pulling data from a bunch of different places. So maybe you've got multiple Claris Pro apps that, you know, as a data source, you're pulling data through. Um, you're using Connect or scripting to pull from third-party web services or ESS and ODBC to get through SQL, or you've got IoT devices that are feeding you data. Uh, and now more recently, the, the ability to take uh, external people collecting data through studio forms and having all of that data uh, populate into Claris Pro. Now, this diagram is a little oversimplified. Um, this data could be being pushed directly to studio. Um, the other, though, is it could be coming like it is today directly into Draco tables, with the exception, obviously, of, of studio forms. But let's say the rest of these you already have, and they're already being pushed into Pro and into, obviously, its underlying Draco table. Well, allowing server to communicate to the Clear Studio side, um, that means things like server-side scripts that maybe you've got running every hour or every night to go and synthesize that data into something meaningful. You could push that to Studio. And then once it's in Studio, you can start building those views on top of it. Um, so this really gives you an opportunity to, to start surfacing data within an organization that may be otherwise hard to get to and getting it to feed folks like a CEO of a company that, again, they're not going to have Pro installed on their machine necessarily, but you can send them an easy link to that particular dashboard that they can bring up on their phone in, on the go or on the desktop and get gain those, uh, those early accent, um, uh, insights. Uh, so hopefully this helps uh, sort of expand on 
to how Clara Studio fits into this and obviously connect already being something that's helping us feed data. And you'll start seeing these three parts of the platform uh, really work well together and sort of uh, uh, accentuate each of their strengths uh, to, to solve challenges. Uh, so coming Robert, back to- Robert, oh, would you ahead. mind just uh, zooming out on that for a second so we can grab a screenshot if that's okay? Uh, sure. It's uh, again, it's this is an internal rough kind of just to get the conversation going. Um, so like I said, this is a little oversimplified. Um, but that's a general idea of it is take all data from all these different sources, get that into your Claris Pro app, get that data synthesized in a way that's meaningful through server side scripting to studio. I have dashboard view here, but it, it could be any. You, you could be creating the spreadsheets or you could be creating the list detail for processing uh, and additional views that you know we'll continue to work on as needed. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, so um, okay, so from Steven, uh, once you get notifications for update data changes, could that imply uh, schema sync? Uh, since the file is on the server. Uh, yeah, potentially. I mean, there's a good bit of uh, engineering effort we need to do to get the three systems, I am including Connect in this, uh, all in sync. You know, so as we're uh, updating records on one side, you know, Connect can automatically trigger the flows or uh, you're making changes in Claris Pro and then your dashboards are updating in Studio. Uh, you know, all of those things uh, would be enabled, but we've got to build that sort of foundation first. And then when we talk about schema again, uh, you know, the exact one-to-one -one nature between Claris Pro and Studio, it's not something we're striving for. It's going to be based on what the needs of the market are and what the needs of all of you are, obviously. Um, and so, you know, that's going to be another incremental thing that you'll see, similar to me just talking about migrating ta Draco tables to Studio with just text number and timestamp. That's our first sort of step. And then we'll continue to build out there based on needs. Uh, da, da. Uh, Tony, thank you again for sharing the links. Let me go back up. I think I may have missed some questions. Uh, so all the schema for Studio is stored in Mongo along with the data. Uh, yes, that's true today. Um, I, I can't stress enough, don't get hung up on Mongo specifically. Um, I know that we've talked about Mongo and we've talked about uh, different technologies we're using on the Studio side. Um, one that does not require that you learn any of those things. Um, you know, we talk about those uh, you know, Mongo specifically is an example, uh, or, or using React, uh, because it will help. That's important for you to know to help strengthen your cases. You go into IT departments, like no IT department ever is going to complain about Mongo. They're going to get that. Um, so there's real strengths in understanding the underlying technology that's there. Um, but by no means is that something that you need to learn, just like you didn't have to learn Objective-C or C++ or the myriad other languages we've written Pro in. That's not to say that we won't expose power there, just like we did in Pro, where you see us introducing the ability if you need to use JavaScript, or of course the plugin community is, has uh, done wonders with you know really getting into Pro code, um, and I absolutely anticipate that we'll do similar things in Studio. Uh, but again, the 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 spirit of Claris remains true here, which is really about enabling all of us to participate in this. Um, you know, I, I, you'll also hear me say this a whole bunch. Uh, but I'm a firm believer in, you know, the value of this platform is about lowering the bar and allowing more people in an organization to express their creativity. Um, I think that's incredibly powerful for us. Um, one of the other things that I'm, I'm really excited about Studio as a longtime FileMaker developer, you know, thinking back to that example of how much time saved by uh, building that data collection form in, in Studio as opposed to Pro, um, that's super valuable to me as a developer because now, of course, I'm, I'm focusing on other more challenging problems. Um, but as we start opening Studio up, you know, again, we've only got the two um, team manager or member roles at the moment. But as we introduce, let's say, a builder role, and don't hold me on the exact terminology there. Uh, but what that will enable then is other po folks in an organization. Of course, Stephen, I know you're on the call. Security will be part of this and making sure that they can't get into things that they shouldn't be able to. Uh, but when we can enable other users in an organization to start building their own views, start collecting their own data, maybe building on top of user data you've already created, um, you start unlocking a lot of potential within an organization to solve challenges. You get way more people in an organization that are proponents of Claris, and you start staving off some of the creeping in of things like Airtable that you may see in an organization because they're already licensed for FileMaker and already have these tools at their disposal. 
Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, working back up the list, I saw a couple of additional questions come in, but uh, there was one here about, is there any performance comparison data between Studio versus Pro's uh, cloud product? Um, so uh, we don't have data just yet. We're going through and you know we're standing this thing up and doing a lot of testing. I will say um, I have seen significant performance improvements on the Studio side just in the last couple of weeks as we optimize. Um, there, when you're if you're comparing it to cloud specifically, um, I anticipate um, much better performance because we're building this thing ground up in cloud technology. So you on a platform that's much more scalable. So you're going to see much better performance. You know, as we've all talked about, you know, FileMaker was born in a world of the land. Um, we've done a lot to improve the performance and scalability of it, but it's got those roots. And so again, here's an opportunity for us to leverage the power on the studio side. Um, alongside the power of the pro side. Uh, so I, I absolutely anticipate there to be situations where, where you need scale and you need um, speed. Some of that starts moving into the studio world um, while you still have core elements of it running in pro. Uh, can you take a question about PyMaker Pro? Uh, oh yeah, I absolutely can take questions about pro if there's anything specifically there. Um, I think I captured the rest of those. Let me come back down. Um, uh, with all the efforts on Studio, what is the state of Pro vis-a-vis uh, -vis improvements to the UX and other development tools? Uh, so I hope this is coming across that um, you know we're continuing to invest in 19, and you're seeing enhancements. We talked about uh, transactions most recently. I get that that's not UX en enhancements. Uh, so we're absolutely still investing, uh, you know, in that world, especially as it relates to you know when it starts building alongside of Studio. Um, UX stuff specifically, a uh, couple of things there. There's, it's not lost on us the importance of the UX in Pro, um, but when you've got a, a layout view the way that we do today, um, it becomes very hard for us to continue to uh, introduce new paradigms there without breaking existing stuff, impacting um, performance and doing it across Pro on Mac, Pro on Windows, through Go and iOS, and then through WebDirect. Uh, I've been the product manager for uh, all four of those products. Uh, and introducing things uh, that implemented across all at the same time can be very difficult. Um, so that's not to say we won't. Uh, I, I just want you to understand that we weren't ignoring it in the past. Uh, there is a lot of uh, focus in Studio, but we again see opportunities for these two worlds to leverage each other. Um, this is something that I showed at the um, Auto Enter Live. It's, I gotta stress, very early on proof of concept, we have not optimized for this. Uh, but I had in my previous window, uh, the registration data being shown through a portal. Uh, but I could swap that out because we have a web viewer and we've got direct links to the, the views. And so now instead of a portal, I've got uh, this spreadsheet view embedded and I get all the benefits of that view of being able to scroll uh, horizontally and rearrange columns and all the things that we've wanted for a long time in portals. Um, now, again, that's not to say that we won't do things UX uh, on the UX side in pro proper. Uh, but we see a huge opportunity to start marrying these two worlds, uh, especially because, again, all that data is in sync. You're using one authentication to get into it. So it really becomes a seamless experience. And there's things that we can do to optimize this so that, you know, it's really easy to, you know, maybe hide this top bar as an example, or, uh, you know, obviously you're going to need to be able to pass it found sets and, and you know, much like we did with uh, JavaScript being bidirectional. I could absolutely imagine having some way from FileMaker to hit a button that then changes the scope of, uh, of this found set. So um, the going back to the question, uh, we absolutely have an appetite for you know, things that we may do in pro. It's all gonna come down to use cases and need and, and prioritization, um, but don't look at the um, uh, effort and energy we're putting into studio as us ignoring what's going on in the Quick Clears Pro side. Again, this is an entire platform where the experience is, is meant to be cohesive. Um, and to your user, at the end of the day, they're not gonna care whether it's pro or studio, it's just about getting their job done. So we just wanna make sure that that is frictionless and as, ex and as a smooth experience as possible. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, Lynn, I, I see the comment about, I'm not sure I want my customers to display their creativity. Uh, 
absolutely. I, again, that's why I say there's, there's, uh, I made that comment to Stephen Blackwell about the security, but it's to everyone in general, right? There's going to be checks so that you you can control, right? I mean, the, the, this can't be the Wild West um, uh, that in theory could do more harm than good. That said, there's going to be people that in an organization, they're just closer to the work. Um, they're going to have insights where if you can give them some play space, so we refer to it as like a user sandbox where maybe they don't interact or don't impact a bunch of the other stuff that you're doing. Um, there's some value in there, especially as you're, as they are now becoming clear as proponents and maybe collecting data that then you can leverage. Um, so I totally hear you though, Lynn. Um, all right, as Stephen, uh, but is there still, uh, but there are still legacy dialogues, custom functions that could be updated that are dev centric. Totally hear you. Uh, and, and I, and that is fair. And I, I'd be completely transparent with you. That's not something that we're focusing on right now from a priority standpoint, but Again, it, it all comes down to use cases and prioritization. So as we're going through the idea section in the community in this example, uh, or we're talking to customers either one-on-one -on -one or in a forum like this, it's always about digging in and understanding the why behind something like the custom functions being asked for. This is a little bit more straightforward for me particularly because I've lived in that dialogue, um, but things like that, understanding it because again, like the DDR request for Studio earlier, um, Understanding the problem will help us come forward with the best solution. And so there may be things, and I'm not I'm making something up here completely, but maybe custom functions live in the studio side and you can leverage them in pro. And so that that dialogue, updating that dialogue doesn't make sense, but giving you the power behind what you're trying to accomplish just lives in a different world because it's, it's more, it's easier for us to deploy and it's easier for you to consume. Um, again, I'm making something up in that particular example, but just so you understand the thought process there. I think I reached the end of the questions in the chat. If I miss anyone, I apologize. Uh, just call it out uh, and let me know. Hey, hey, Robert, I had a question, and I know licensing is a whole can of worms you mm -hmm. may not be ready to get into, but just one thing occurred to me when you were talking about you know setting up a view or a hub for an occasional user who doesn't need mm -hmm. you know, the full power of the uh, FileMaker or Clarus Pro, just conceptually, is mm -hmm. that that user, that's gonna become an additional user who's gonna need a license just to see that one, one view or that one hub, is that correct? Um, that potentially, um, so they're, yeah, they're it's still a, early. A user record, a, a, an ID, right, so. Potentially. Potentially. Um, so in the beginning, uh, that is true um, for things like a dashboard, right? You'll, you'll need a Claris ID to log in and, and see those views. Uh, but we already have forms, uh, which you can publish as a, as a public link and anyone can come and submit data and, and, and not need to log in first. And one of the things that um, you'll hear us talk about, we, we, we and many of the, the uh, sort of the market at large refer to it as a customer portal, uh, where you have someone that um, you know, may not have a uh, Claris Studio ID or Claris ID uh, rather, um, but they do need to access data uh, that, that you're sharing up. Um, so right now, the answer is yes, uh, but I don't think that's always going to be the case. And it's, sorry, again, use cases uh, are gonna be key here. Um, you know, what are you trying to share? What kind of data are you trying to share? Is it something where maybe they don't need a Claris ID, but they do need you need you need some way to identify who they are to wrap them to their correct records? Like those are all the things that we're thinking about currently. Um, the the important thing here to understand is what we're focused on is removing friction across the board, um, and so the more that we can understand that friction, uh, the better. So when you're talking about those kinds of things, where hey, I just have someone in an organization that just needs quick access to the dashboard. I don't want them to have a clear studio ID. Helping us understand why a studio ID is a, uh, or I should say Claris ID is a friction point are things that will help us as we identify or um, build out the solutions to those problems. Uh, da, da, okay, uh, Bob, I see uh, we need a way to allow a uh, selection from a drop down that results in a hidden ID instead of a value list to users. Uh, it's always been messy with an ugly choice between stacked fields or, okay. Um, so Bob, are you referring to, we need this in the Claire's pro world? Or are you saying we need this as a general sense here? Okay. Could you speak to that more? Yeah, I was just, that was kind of a follow on to my other question about um, development of 
of pro and 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 the and the UX. Um, you know, this is something that I think is just long overdue, frankly, Robert. Um, you mm-hmm. know, it's you know the problem that I'm talking about, right? You know, we want we want somebody to choose oh, from a drop down menu and get an ID, but not know that they got an ID, and instead they get the result that they see. And when they click back in the field, they shouldn't see the ID instead of what they you know the actual data that they think they're viewing and uh mm-hmm. it's you know it's it's just the way it works right now and has worked for years and years is just dumb <laughs> you know in today's world i mean we need something better you know and so mm-hmm. i'm just getting on a soapbox a little bit here forgive me but uh, you're here yeah. and i'm here and so here i am <laughs> yeah absolutely no i i, I appreciate it and, and you know I, I am very familiar with this one um i did take a screenshot of it just to remind me because there are some elements where it, again I, I can't stress enough it, it's all a prioritization game right and we, we've got thousands uh, of ideas up on the on the community um we have our own you know goals that we're, we're trying to achieve and trying to marry all those things so understanding that underlying sort of pain point friction, where that's challenging you. Again, this is one I do know um, um, well, because <laughs> I've run into it myself. Um, but as we look at um, how we build this in studio and how we want studio and Claire's Pro to interact with each other and be consistent, um, you know, these are things absolutely that are sort of top of mind right now. So it's good to, to have these uh, brought back together or, you know, brought back up again. So I appreciate that, Bob. Um, so I'm close to being out of time, uh, but I, 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 and I know, I'm not sure, uh, Jonathan, what your schedule is today. Um, I think we had an hour booked, so I want to respect all people's time as well. Yep. No, and, and we're just coming up on an hour and that's exactly what we had scheduled. So, um, maybe open it up for any last, last questions, uh, to the auctioneer going once, <laughs> going twice. <laughs> uh, I had a question. Uh, oh, I'll make a Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Um, you had mentioned that with the studio product that, that your goal is to make it easier to accommodate data from multiple tables on the same page. And mm-hmm. regarding that issue in FileMaker Pro, <clears throat> excuse me, the solution is obviously, you know, the use of portals that mm-hmm. they, they essentially act like proxies for, for other another window in a list view that you can embed in layout. The problem is that um, it's an incomplete implementation of a window list view because mm-hmm. it doesn't support all the parts that you normally get in a list view layout. And yep. so I'd like to see, and I've and I've been hoping to see this for literally a, more than a decade, uh, a full imp- full implementation of list view and portals where you can add other parts like sub summaries and and grand summaries and things like that. And that would that would uh, that would be a great addition to the, you know, functionality and usefulness of, of the portals. Totally hear you. Um, and as someone that's been in product for about a decade, I've wanted that as well. It's incredibly challenging with the way that FileMaker is built today. Uh, Wesley Powell, uh, who many of you know, uh, it's sort of my counterpart in the engineering side, and I have looked at this problem a whole bunch of different ways. Um, I showed an example of Studio potentially solving that. Um, I, it's not perfect, and we, we've got work to optimize and, and make that a real solution. Um, but we understand the the core challenge, which is the the uh, the end user's experience that you're trying to generate. So I doubt it. I, to be completely transparent, that we would go in and make portals the object that you know today do those things. Uh, but we will solve the problem that you have underlying. There's a what's the fundamental technical issue in FileMaker Pro to implement to do implementation that supports parts in a portal? Um, I'm not the right person to answer that articulately. I mean, we we need the Clays and the Wes's of the world to to give you the outline there, um, but it has been something that we've looked at quite a number of times. Mm. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Hey, Robert. I, I will say sorry. The one last thing on there to be clear. Anything is possible through engineering, <laughs> uh, it, you know. So I don't want to say that it's impossible. It's just the amount, the, the amount of resources and effort it would take, comparative to other things that we could do to make other significant en- enhancements, is where we have the trade-off challenge that we have. Um, so again, we we want to make sure that we're solving the problem, and, and it may not be the you know enhancing portal specifically. So that that was the last thing I'll say there. Sorry, uh, someone was about to speak. Uh, yeah, I was just going to have a little tack on uh, UI question. 
Um, mm -hmm. and, and while I was waiting, it became two. Uh, it's about uh, card windows, really, really mm -hmm. specific. Is, is there any chance that we're ever going to see card windows supporting transparency and backgrounds? And what I mean is this, if you have, uh, if you pop up a card window and you want to put rounded corners on it, mm -hmm. get it, you have square corners. Um, right. Can we, are we ever going to see that? Or is that like one of those engineering mountains that looks like a molehill, but boy, it's a mountain. Uh, um, and so at just to tack onto that for the, the multi view that you were talking about, might we ever get multiple card windows? Um, so again, I, I will, you'll never hear me say absolutely no to something. It's, it, it's <laughs> the prioritization game. Um, it's not the priority right now. It, so the, uh, the window thing, it, is doable it's not you know a molehill but it's not a mountain either um it's it just really comes down to the priority and you know the focus um and as we you know build more uh, the other thing i'll say there is if you remember we built card windows in pro and go first and it took quite a while to get to web direct right so there is a cost implementing it four times essentially across all the platform um so is there opportunities where we can solve that a different way potentially are we focused on you know making rounded corners or a, a opacity for um transparency rather for uh card windows right now uh, honestly no uh but is that to say that we will never get to it that's a no as well right it, it's it's going to be a priority understanding where we've got the most friction where you guys are challenged the most and making sure that we're focused on those things um there are if you all think that you have a list of things that you'd love to see in FileMaker, uh, I can guarantee you my list is probably just as long. Um, and, and if I had a magic wand, there's there's lots of things that I would do. Um, but it, it's really going to be about us focusing on making sure that we're building the best platform for today for us all to make sure that, you know, we continue having these jobs that we all love for the next 35 years. Um, so again, it's I, I'm, I hope that it's not coming off as me being dismissive about any of these things in the Claire's Pro side of things. It's not, you know, absolutely. We're looking at where we can make enhancements there intelligently. Um, but again, broken record, it's all going to be a prioritization game. Um, and, and we believe that there's things here that we're focused on right now that are going to have much bigger impacts to all of you and your success. Um, and we will, as that continues to grow, continue to look at those things. Sure. And that makes a lot of sense. I think if if I, I'll speak for myself, maybe it reflects other people's, there, there is uh, a sense that comes up um, periodically watching demos like this of, wow, that is really cool new technology. And also, does that mean that they're going to leave the other stuff alone and starve it of engineering resources? And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it, it's always a concern. You never know what a company is going to do. And so I think that's the source of some of these questions. Absolutely. And we get it. I, you know, there, there's, <clears throat> it, you know, the idea of us like starving FileMaker, right? Like, like this is the platform as a whole is what brings all of this power. It's the ability to say yes to any challenge sitting in front of us. And the thing that we're focused on right now is making sure that we give you the best tools to be able to say yes. And sometimes that yes is going to mean enhancements through Claris Pro, it just is. It's gonna. It's all gonna be about looking at the challenges we have in front of us. What are the biggest ones that cause the most friction, uh, and knocking those things down. Um, so I hope that you see that in the work that we're doing. And I get that there's gonna be cases where we all want that one particular thing, feature or behavior change. Um, but I hope that it's clear what why we're focusing on the things that we're focusing on. Um, and that you feel heard. Uh, I know that that's something that we've not done perfectly in the past. Uh, there's a huge effort here for us to make sure that we set up listening channels and and sort of structure that in a way that you feel that feedback loop. Um, being, again, transparent, I understand that's not always been the case, but hopefully seeing Steve and I here today, seeing that we've been going to things like auto enter um, and continue to do a lot of these types of touch points, uh, and you'll see the, uh, you know, feedback in the product, feedback through the community start to improve. Um, so we we are listening um, and we're giving you the sort of understanding why we're doing the things that we're doing. And on that note, I think we do need to wrap it up, but I wanna thank Robert and Steve for, for coming out today and, and sharing in this sort of, you know, back and forth, very casual way. I think it's, um, you know, almost reflective of the change in the style you know that you have used you have you gone to a more iterative approach um being able to have this sort of dialogue 
frequently, maybe even a short, shorter session more frequently, um, I think is valuable on both sides just to see the, uh, the direction things are going and um, us to be able to give you feedback on that. So I hope you'll come back soon. Um, we'll have an opportunity to do something like this again. And um, I'm gonna pause the recording for right now. All right, so next up we have Dave Ramsey gonna be uh, presenting on FM comparison, which I was looking back, I think you presented a couple of years ago and when it, when it was still in its fairly early phases. So um, okay. nice to have you back now that it's uh, in the wild as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Dave, for those who don't know, is the uh, creator of uh, FM Perception initially and now FM Comparison, both really great tools for FileMaker developers to uh, you know, doing their work. I personally couldn't, couldn't live without FM Perception. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, go ahead. It's all your floor is yours. Well, awesome. Hopefully when we're done, um, you won't be able to live with it without FM Comparison either. Sounds good. So let me uh, here um, start share. Nice black screen. Um, hey, can everybody see that big slide? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Yep. So, uh, here specifically to talk about FM comparison, which is a diff tool for FileMaker systems. And it is a companion tool to FM perception. Um, I'm Dave Ramsey. Uh, I've been writing a lot of code and a lot of FileMaker code for a really long time. Um, these days, it a lot of it is uh, C Sharp and .NET stuff, which is weird but it is what it is. Um, and I'm really not kidding. I am really, really bad at mountain biking. Um, so FM comparison uses the V2 XML. This is the save a copy as XML from the developer menu uh, rather than the DDR. And it requires FileMaker Pro 19 plus. Um, it's out now. Uh, this morning, I released version 101 with some bug fixes, um, and it is free for all FM Perception users as long as your support is still active. It is effectively a new feature of FM Perception that's just being deployed as a separate application. Okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so... FM perception is kind of an easy sell. Uh, I, I can just do a quick demo and go, ta-da. And everybody goes, great. Um, with FM comparison, we haven't had really good diff tools in the FileMaker community as something that basically everybody could use. Um, and we haven't really had the XML export that would properly support it until recently either. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about diffing and why it's important and how you would use it. Um, kind of the most obvious thing that pops to mind is version changes. We go from version one to version two and you know, we can make that kind of stuff easy or automate it, use something like auto. Um, but in the end, we need to be able to kind of describe those changes and track those changes. Um, it's also really nice when you're doing a new version. Whenever I do the version notes for FM comparison, I'm going back to my diffs to see what actually changed in the system. Because very often, while I had one or two target things in mind, I'll actually come up or solve a couple of other problems while I'm in there doing other things. And so being able to really itemize those changes with a diff tool is really helpful. Um, being able to compare versions, track work that's being done is really good when you're coordinating between groups. Um, this works up and down 
and also works laterally. So if it's teams working together or working with contractors or junior devs or having a meeting with a customer about what's been accomplished in the last three months of work and what they actually got for all the money that they spent, being able to kind of quickly itemize the changes and speak about them definitively can be really helpful. Um, it's massively helpful for those people with vertical market apps where you've got lots of different versions all slightly tweaked of basically the same database, but they're all different. And having to come along after version one and 30 versions of 1.1 and deploy version two to a bunch of customers and make sure that their custom mods make the trip really needs something that can do kind of an itemized detailed what changed. Um, there's another really big use case. Yeah, I that? work on a copy, a local copy of a customer's files, and then I go up on theirs and replicate the changes there. And right now I'm just documenting those changes manually, the things that I need to do in their system to make it compatible. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's always something missed and I get the yep. call the next day. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So yeah, that would be a great use case too. And one of my favorite uses that's popped up, and we'll talk about this more a little bit later, but is confirming that no changes have been made. How many of us have deployed a system at a client site and they've got some kind of administrative access and they come back two weeks later and say, hey, the system isn't working, it's broken, it's your responsibility to fix it. And you go in there and you're pretty sure that it's changed, but being able to document, no, it changed on this date at this time by this login made the changes or confirming, nope, they absolutely didn't change anything. This is still my problem, that this is a, a bug that wasn't introduced after the fact. Um, and so that's interesting. It, it's using a diff tool to find that nothing changed, which is kind of fun. Um, so why do you need a special app? I mean, diff tools have existed for years. Claris demoed the new XML doing a diff using BBEdit, which is fast and clean. And I love BBEdit. It's a fantastic piece of software. Um, and like Git and Subversion, all these version control systems, they have their own built-in diff tools. Why can't we just use that? And the problem is kind of in the nature of the way this XML is um, structured and what it represents that doesn't fit well with classic um, uh, diff functionality or just a plain text diff of the XML. So the first thing is file size. Um, I regularly see 100, 200, 300 megabyte XML files from customers. The biggest I've seen is about 550, 560 megabytes. And most regular diff tools are gonna to throw up their hands at that. Uh, BB Edit can handle it, no problem. And we'll get further into where that still remains an issue. Um, but the file size causes significant problems when you're trying to do those kinds of diffs. The next problem is in context. So in a layout definition in the XML, every single layout object is arranged kind of in a list, a little bit hierarchical with things like fields in a tab object are inside the tab object. So it's deeply nested, but there's two to say eight lines of XML per layout object. So let's say that we're looking at a layout object that has changed because I just added it. That, that's what I did. I added a layout object. And so it's gonna be the last item in that XML. I may have to scroll up a thousand lines of XML code to find out what layout that object got added to. It's, it's not a small thing to get to there. It's way up. Um, there's also, when you're looking at uh, text XML and doing that diff, um, when things reorder, they're not necessarily tracked in a way that's helpful to us as FileMaker developers. So let's say that I previously had that layout object 
uh, as the topmost item in the layout. And then I pushed it all the way to the back. It's now going to be the first thing in the definition on that layout. Now, a text diff tool is going to tell you that you added a new layout object at the top of the list and deleted a layout object at the bottom of the list. But that's not what you do as a FileMaker developer to recreate that change in a copy of the system. You just change what level, what layer it's on. And so having something that has an understanding of what the kinds of changes are that FileMaker developers make to systems and how to represent those to you as a user is immensely helpful. And then there's looking at things like indent. So we, I talked about how a field is contained inside the XML for a tab object. Well, when I put a field into the tab object, that field may have been there for years. But when I put it into the tab object, its definition subtly changes in that its indent increases. It's a hierarchical thing in the same way that these bullet points on this slide indent. Well, that extra space, that extra tab at the beginning will show up in a diff as a change. And so you got to go to it and look at it and go, okay, but this is still fine. It otherwise didn't change. And that assumes that while putting this text object inside the tab, we didn't substantively move where it was in the list because if it moved very far, it's just going to register as a deletion and an addition. So, hey Dave, something yeah, that it, it occurred to me as you're saying this may be obvious, but it may be a way of sort of encapsulating everything you're saying is obviously as FileMaker developers, we are not typing a DDR or an XML file. Right? Exactly. So other developers who are used to using diff tools, they're typing code into a text editor, and the diff tool is telling them the differences between those code, that code. The, the, the XML from FileMaker is being generated reflecting work that we did, but that is not the work that we did. So maybe that's a way of sort of summarizing why our needs are very different um, from, from traditional uses of diff tools. Yep, absolutely. Um, so this is, in my humble opinion, why you need a native app to do this kind of analysis rather than some kind of web tool, JavaScript, something like that. Big one is performance. Um, you need to be able to process large to humongous files as quickly as possible. Make your changes and then do it again. And sending hundreds of megabytes of XML to a web service is actually pretty time consuming, especially if you're going to do it cyclically. There's also a security aspect. And this comes in in the fact that the XML v2 is designed to eventually be able to completely reproduce your database from that XML, including all of the accounts with passwords and everything, which means if somebody has that XML, they have your system. Um, and so a lot of customers won't send me a copy of a piece of their XML because of security concerns. So keeping all of this stuff happening locally on your machine, I think is generally pretty important, at least in a lot of cases. So if you are an FM perception user, there is a diff tool built into FM perception and it totally works. It's fine, there are plenty of people using it. However, it's really, really noisy. Um, the diff tool built into FM perception sees it, its core unit of change, like the, the, the context table is a single changed property. And so every single time a property changes, FM perception spits out another row of information and it just floods you. Tens or hundreds of thousands of lines of changes. And then basically the only way to deal with it is to kind of export all that out, pull it into a FileMaker database and start kind of filtering through it to try and figure out what's actually going on in the system. Uh, it works, it's effective, it was fine for its time, but it really wasn't as helpful to developers as I wanted it to be. 
Um, so that's really where FM comparison comes into the game. Um, it uses the file maker object, the file maker element, the field, the table, the script, the layout as the root element of change and says, hey, this field definition changed. And then if you care about that field, and when you're looking at your changes, you can click on it and it will itemize all the changes for that item. Dramatic reduction in noise. It also has some really cool stuff for saying, there are certain kinds of changes I don't care about. Um, and I'll show you some examples of that in a second. As a matter of fact, it happens right now. Um, let me bring up FM comparison. Okay, and this is the basic interface for getting started. And so the first thing we need to do is select two XML files. So I'm gonna go in here and let's find, and we're gonna use ledger link. And I can select an older one and then a newer one, and it loads those two XML files. There's some advanced configuration stuff that I'll talk about in a couple minutes. But once I've got the two XML files loaded, I can then say, okay, now run the comparison and then view the results. And this is what we get for output it is telling us, okay, we added 15 fields, we deleted one and we edited 30 of them. So I can click here and say, hey, what happened here? Okay, field comment added, nothing else. Now you see a number of things flagged here and that has to do with data that FileMaker or Claris has put into the XML as helpful stuff that tracks changes. We've always kind of had modification count. It's always been out there, but they gave us more recently the modification username, modification account name and modification timestamp for those changes, which is awesome. Especially when you can find out who made that change. Um, and so for a new, any new item, we get all the properties spit out. Deleted ones, we can tell what the thing was that got deleted. And for modified ones, we actually get the side by side. Let's see if we can find a better one. Here we go. Um, so here's one where it's auto enter calculation changed to definition. Barbara cleaned up this broken calc. Awesome. Thanks, Barbara. Um, I don't know if Barbara's still on the call. She was earlier. I am. I hate to okay. be the Hi. I can. Fixing Todd's work. Good, 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 good. Good, yes. <laughs> Fixing Todd's work. Um, so this is the basic usage loop for FM comparison. Two versions of a system. You have the XML for it. Spit it out. Pull it into FM comparison. And it tells you what the differences are between those things. Um, so one of the things that I did though is a particularly confusing element of changes to a system has to do with organization. Okay, think about reordering scripts. Reordering scripts in the list as a general rule of thumb, though not universally, doesn't change the functionality of the system. However, some people care about it very much and some people care about it not at all. And so for organization type things, we separated out organization changes from actual functional changes to the system. So I can see the scripts here and see that we added 20 of them, deleted three and edited 62 of them. But if I go look at script organization, I actually get a side by side of what the script order was in the old system versus the new system and some color codes that help me figure out what's moved where. So in this case, this blue is not saying that the script was edited. It's saying that the script was moved. I can actually click on this one and it will show me where it moved to. So if I care about the changes, that's cool. If I need to recreate the changes, it's also really helpful. But if for my current workflow, I don't care about the fact that I reordered some scripts, then I can just completely ignore this item and never have to see any of the details about it. 
and just focus on the scripts as they changed and looking at, okay, we removed this commented outline of code and added in this replace field contents step. Um, now, one of the things that using the new XML gave us is the DDR told us all sorts of wonderful things about all the table occurrences on the graph, except for where they were on the graph. The Cartesian coordinates for where the table occurrences were wasn't available to us. But in the new XML, it is. And so I can actually draw your graph side by side and we can look at where things have changed, where things were added, stuff like that. This basically follows uh, Google Maps style manipulation and navigation. But anytime you click on something on one side, it aligns the other side to match. So you can more easily, you just, you just have to find what you're looking for in one place and it will fix the other side for optimal comparison capabilities. Dave, I got to tell you that that looks useful in non-diff uses too. <laughs> yeah. Can you, click, can you click on the right and it will realign to the left as well? Sure. Let's go here and zoom out and I'll click on that. So you only have to do one of them if I wanted to see kind of the whole thing and go right there and then click on this. And now I'll see the whole thing on both sides. Um, yep, bi-directional. There's also some zoom buttons, home to bring it back to 100% in the top left corner, that kind of thing. Um, but this is fun. And yes, when you're talking about in a non-diff capacity, I can't wait until I can use some of this stuff in FM perception. Um, oh, maybe. I'm just talking about in a large solution where it says, you know, it's in this table and I'm like, where did I put that? Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, but this then isolates the changes to relationships. You know, we added two relationships. If all I care about is adding back the functionality and I don't want to try and make the two graphs the same, then all I have to do is these changes. All of these changes are irrelevant. This is an organization category. It's basically purely visual. Um, themes was a fun one because when you edit a theme, um, FileMaker does something kind of funny in that it can completely reorder the CSS nodes in the theme, completely scramble them, which means if you try and diff the XML or diff the CSS straight out of the XML, it's just noise all over the place. You're creating and deleting things left and right. And so what FM Comparison does is says, okay, stop, split the CSS by node, sort them all alphabetically, and then show you side by side where the changes are. Um, and so you can get to see where things got added or also where a single property was modified. Uh, the thing that I'm doing to condense this display is this button in the corner that says show non-changes or hide non-changes. So if you get into something like a field definition, I can just see, okay, it was just top level metadata that changed. There's no actual property change in this thing, which happens from time to time. Um, you know, you can end up saving a thing that didn't really change it. It's a FileMaker thing. That's where some of these um, advanced configuration options start coming into play. Uh, the first thing that you can do with advanced configuration is say, I don't need to see the whole thing. Hide some of this stuff from me. Really useful when you're sitting down with a customer and you don't want them getting distracted by a bunch of other numbers showing up in that sidebar. And so we could do things like turn off 
these sections and just say, okay, I just care about this stuff. This is all I want to show them. You can then run the comparison that way. Um, relevant changes is about saying, yeah, something changed on this item, but it's a kind of change that I don't care about. So stop telling me about it. This feature really came out of um, users separating themselves into kind of two general groups and aligning themselves along a spectrum between those. And on one end of the spectrum is people who say, tell me about absolutely everything that changed. I've got a junior developer, they're playing with stuff that I don't want them playing with. Tell me every single property that changed. If they looked at the thing funny, I want to know about it. And at the other end of the spectrum were developers who said, I only care about functional changes. Don't tell me about anything that doesn't change the functionality of the system. And so that's what we can do kind of with this. If I turn all these things off, what I do is I say, okay, we saw where that one field here had, you know, its modification count and username and account and timestamp changed, but no other properties changed. So I can actually turn these off and say, if that's all that changed, just mark that thing as unchanged. And it will. Um, some people really care when a script comment gets edited. But if you're just looking for a functional change that caused a bug, the script comments are not relevant. Adding or removing white space, breakpoints, stuff like that. You know, editing the breakpoints on a script edit, edits the script. And so if I was doing a lot of debugging and marking breakpoints in a bunch of different scripts, suddenly I've got all these changes that aren't real i mean they're real changes but they're not functional changes so just stop telling me about it um these things down here are predominantly around uh add-ons and things like that relationship drag direction is a fun one in filemaker in the xml there are properties for the left to and the right to of a relationship however those are misnamed because they're not the left TO and the right TO. They are the TO you dragged from and the TO you dragged to. Which means that if I drag from left to right, export the XML, and then delete that relationship and redraw it from right to left, huge structures of the XML of that relationship have changed, even though it's functionally not any different. And so if you're rebuilding code that somebody else made, you might see a bunch of relationships flag as different because the ends aren't matching up. It's this way versus that way. And so turning this off will just make all of those disappear. If that's the only change to it, was which TO was at which end? It's not a change I care about, hide it from me. And then linking rules. And linking rules are, complicated and a little bit beyond the scope of this discussion, though we can get into it if we've got time and people are curious. But what it really has to do with is the logic that FM comparison uses to say, these two objects are dissimilar, but treat them as the same object. And depending upon the kind of XML that you're comparing, you might have to change those rules. So sequential is kind of our classic version one begets version two kind of situation. But branched is about, um, okay, I have a customer and I made a system for them. And then five years ago, they bought another company. And so we made a copy of that system for the other company. And then these two versions of the system have continued growing independently of each other. And now they want to try and unify it. So I've got to compare these two systems, neither of which really begat the other. They're both leaves on a tree. And now I'm comparing those. And so 
it's suboptimal. The perfect way to do it would be to have XML for the system at the time that you split it into two copies. But sometimes that's not available. This also happens fairly commonly in those situations with the vertical uh, app developers where they don't have the old baseline. So they have to compare to uh, end user versions and see what's different between them. Um, and disconnected is for um, when you have, <coughs> excuse me, injected a piece of code into someone's, let's say you applied an add-on to your system and now the add-on developer has released a new version of the add-on. So you shove the new add-on into an empty database and now you're comparing that to your live system and trying to find where these things connect. Um, and then custom if you're crazy. Um, try to avoid that if you can. Um, and honestly, 90 to 95% of FileMaker developers are gonna leave it on sequential as the default forever, and it won't be a problem. Um, so yeah. I think if there's anything else that I really need to show here. Nope. Uh, I think that generally covers it. Uh, there's a file metadata section for file level settings, comparison metadata. And this is also right now where we're putting um, information about what that configuration was. So all the configuration settings that were run at the time are all documented here. Um, there isn't currently a way to easily change those settings and rerun it, but there's nothing to stop you from opening a new window, setting up different configuration, and then running the comparison again in a separate window. Um, working on that, it's on the agenda. To borrow a phrase from uh, Claris, uh, it's all a question of priorities. Um, also, for those people who are working on small screens, there's some fun UI stuff that we could do here. So one of them is um, I can collapse this entire sidebar and it becomes a drop down. So now I have much more screen real estate to play with. If, for example, I've got a MacBook Air or something like that with a really small screen and I need as much screen real estate as possible, or if I'm just trying to focus. Um, so that's there. Uh, what was the other thing? Um, we put a lot of effort into making this entire UI uh, key scrollable. So I'm just arrowing right, left, up and down, spacebar to select. So if you want to spend your entire time um, navigating through this then uh with without using a mouse you're welcome to i'm a mouse guy joe the ui designer is a keyboard guy and so both of them have been well represented um yeah so i think i'm going to step out of this for right now and go back to my slides for a hey, hey dave i see there's a question in the chat about is there a lighter view looks like this is sort of like dark mode. Is there a light mode it, in there? Frame? Absolutely is. Um, I've got my machine set to dark mode right now. Uh, dark mode has more vibrant colors to it for contrast. Um, but even in, um, even if my machine is set to dark mode, I can set FM comparison to light mode. I'm sorry if I just blinded everyone. <laughs> That is a hundred times easier. <laughs> Some of us need a uh, higher contrast. Right. So you'll see that um, things like um, here, the, the highlight colors on this text are much lighter in light mode. But you can toggle that even on the fly just by hitting a uh, command period. So you can have your machine in dark mode, but run FM comparison in light mode or vice versa, or transition just for a moment when you're looking at something and, and need a little more contrast and then drop back to the other mode 
when you don't. I usually use it in light mode. Again, Joe's usually using it in dark mode. Um, everybody's stuff is being covered. The other thing is because this is uh, using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to do the UI, we did get uh, the ability to tackle one of the most requested features for FM perception, which is the ability to adjust the font size. So those of us with older eyes um, can blow up the UI to something that we can comfortably see and read. OK, um, let me bring up the chat real quick here. Um, we're replicating code changes from, for example, dev to production. Does that have a comparison to facilitate the tracking of the underlying IDs for scripts, fields, other? Okay. If you want so, me to flesh that out a bit. Well, so the, the IDs are there. And if the ID changes, that's a change, unless you told it that that wasn't a relevant change. So here, here's what I'm thinking is that uh, if, if you've got a vertical market application where mm -hmm. systems out in the wild and you want to patch them and stuff like that, and then let's say multi-file systems, everything goes a heck of a lot easier if uh, field IDs and scripts are identical. You know, so I said you can, you can call a subscript in an external file and it's yeah. going to match on ID. And you could, you know, be interacting from one file A to file B, touching a field, and if the field ID is uniform across your multiple deployments, that's good news. So right. I, I was thinking of a feature of like, if if FM uh, comparison can call can tell you, hey, here's the next ID. Monkey Bread can tell you the IDs of various objects mm -hmm. of fields. I just looked um, scripts valueless and i think a few others i don't believe monkey bread tells you table ids and i think table ids are relevant for some code although i couldn't come up with an example right now by the way very very cool stuff you're showing including the visualization of the table of uh, what's that thing called the relationship graph which yeah. brings me and this is my final part of this kind of combined question about ids is would it be useful and or possible to put the table id onto the visualization and or would it be possible to visually indicate what is the primary table occurrence in case someone is potentially um, migrating a system from unified yuck to uh, anchor buoy? And those are my questions. OK, um, let me see if I can tackle those. So I don't get information currently about what the next field ID to be handed out would be. So if you I could guess based upon the maximum of the field IDs, but if you had created a field and deleted it, I would have no record of the fact that that ID had already been consumed. Um, what you can do is, is leave it on the default to tell you when an ID has changed. And if none of the script IDs have changed, then you're not going to have a problem migrating script references. That sounds um, good, yeah. I mean, I'm sure. So and the, you we could leave something for the developer to do. Tool doesn't have to do it all. Right. Um, and the so I just released 101 um, FM comparison 1.1. It's our next feature release is going to include a JSON export of the results. So if you want to do more elaborate reporting or analysis, apply some crazy logic to it you'll be able to do that. Um, additionally, I'd love to hear about things that people are doing with that information because some of those things will almost certainly get rolled into the software. Um, did I tackle all your stuff? You threw on a couple things right at the tail end there. Oh, table occurrence ID on the visualization. Um, Yeah, I mean, my my intention initially, it, it, I, I think you're going to really get that in general here, is that that is a table occurrence edit. The graph is really about the visual orientation. Um, and I don't want to get people looking there to find property changes 
on the table occurrences themselves, if that makes sense. Um, the more data that we stick onto this, the less it becomes just an organization category and the more it becomes a critical step to the process, regardless of what you're doing. Hey, Dave, here's, the, here's the use case hey. uh, for the genesis of the question is that for a system that's not anchor buoy, we'll sometimes run query the underlying SQL or use SQL to query the underlying table structure yeah. to get a text that we'll put onto a relationship graph in the form of a node to discern which which table occurrences should absolutely or should more properly be anchor tables. Um, but it's not a necessary feature. I'm just kind of playing along at home. I like what you're doing here. It looks pretty terrific. Uh, just a couple of things to think about for version 3.0. Okay. Uh, okay, hey, I'm David. happy. Thanks. David, a uh, uh, follow on on Tony's. Is there an ability to um, like right click on a table occurrence in the graph representation that you have there to link to this view? Uh, not at present, no. Um, I like that. Although, note that the just because something has changed in its definition here doesn't mean that it's going to have changed down here. So the information that I would need to create that link is present. The information that you would need in order to right click on the thing, in order to know that you should right click on the thing to find its changes, isn't there. Does that make sense? There are 156 changed table occurrences. There are only two as far as the graph organization is concerned, because only two were moved. So when I come in here, graph representation there, not just changed elements in the graph, right? Right. So you could, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm getting into the weeds on, on how or, or what it would look like, but, you know, uh, in, in regular FileMaker, it would just be, you know, a button that shows up or doesn't show up because this is changed or not changed or right. a button that's lit up or not lit up or whatever. Um, but uh, I think that would get uh, folks like Tony whatever kind of extra detail they're looking for and relieve uh, the system from trying to figure out which pieces of that to provide for everybody. Gotcha. Um, yeah, maybe that or maybe a tooltip. Just hovering over the thing would provide a little bit of additional information. Um, could get partway there. I do like this as an interface to table occurrences because I don't really think of my table occurrences by name. I think of my table occurrences on the graph. Me too. Um, but yeah. That'll that'll require some thought. Let me think on that one. Um, Eric Matthews, does any other tool track who changed what when? This is the first time I ever saw this. Um, I don't know of another tool that does. It's information that's only available in the new XML. And not a lot of developers have started making use of that yet. Um, for one thing, it's a moving target. So I'm going to have to continuously revise this to keep up with what they're doing in new versions of FileMaker as they change the XML. Um, and um, there is um, there were some missing properties to it. There's still some missing properties that are keeping it from being used by things like FM Perception, Base Elements, and Inspector Pro uh, for full-on analysis, which might also be able to do that stuff. Let me point out one other thing real quick, which is an important aspect when we're talking about this. Looking at this modification count, you see how it went from two to three? Actually, let me toggle real quick. So it went from two to three, which means there was one change cycle that introduced these changes, okay? Basically that, which means that I can know definitively that Barbara added this text. However, let me see if I can find a good one. Here we go. This one jumps from two to five. There were three change cycles. I only have user information about the fifth one. Okay, which means that I can't tell you definitively that Barbara added this text. 
This is a, an aspect of the data that Claris is making available to us and the data that they're tracking. They're not tracking the change history of an object. They're tracking the last person to change the object. So be careful when using this information to blame someone for screwing up when these modification counts are more than a single step. Because Todd could have made modifications three and four and added this stuff and Barbara just touched the thing in a weird enough way to cause that to move from four to five. And so she had nothing to do with those changes. It's not a it complete audit happened. trail. It's just, um, it tells you what the difference was between the last time you checked. Right. Yes. So in order to find out what happened in modifications three and four and who made them, you'd have to have more exports and do more comparisons. Find something between 525 and 630. There was a one month, four day period here. Grab something in the middle and compare it to this and see what it looks like. So how but fast can these run, these uh, updates? I'm sorry? How, how fast can, um, how long does it take to execute one of these um, differences? Uh, that's entirely dependent upon the XML size. It's also fairly dependent upon the number of changes. So one of the first things that it does after it's loaded this XML and start and parsed it, when you start the comparison, it goes through and links all these things up and anything that it can link up that has no changes whatsoever, it ignores for the rest of the process. So if there's only five or 10 changes from one generation to the next, it's faster than if there's 8,000 changes from one generation to the next. Um, so, so you could conceive it, can it, would people possibly want to just and able to run this every single night? Sure. Yeah. Huh. I mean, here is, I'll, I'll go ahead and do one for you. Here's a slightly larger one. This is, I think I have 87 meg chunk of XML. It's FM starting point. Um, let me remember how my uh, alphabet works, especially since those aren't sorted alphabetically. Um, this one is also intentionally exceptionally noisy. And so we have to wait for those to finish. Loading and then begin comparison. Done. Mm -hmm. There you go. Hundreds, thousands of edited things. Um, <clears throat> so relatively quick, all things considered. Hey, Dave, uh, can you speak to the issue of uh, multi-file solution? Because obviously with the DDR, it was it seems sort of based around the notion that there would be multiple files in the solution and that you would could export the DDR for all of them and all that. And it yeah. seems to say this XML is file based, single file based. I'm just curious when you're dealing with a multiple file solution, how that comes into play. Um, so multi file solutions can a introduce noise just this way. So, for example, you've got a UI file and a data file, and um, you're editing field names in the data file the UI file automatically updates, which means all of the calculation definitions that reference any of those renamed files have changed. It's on my list for the future to dig into this further and try and back those out and say, because the field name changed, this calculation would have changed, but this is not a calculation change that I care about because this was not made by a user, this was made by FileMaker because of another change to the system. That's on the agenda, but it's further out. They just recently added parsed tokenized calculations to the XML. It was one of the two big stumbling blocks keeping people from being able to make substantive use of the new XML for DDR style functionality. The second piece that we're missing, and it's still missing, unfortunately, is there's stuff in the XML, the, the DDR XML, that disambiguates file references. So imagine a external file reference 
<clears throat> or an external uh, data reference in FileMaker whose path is a variable and it's being defined at runtime. When you export the DDR, there is a little extra chunk of code that pops into that XML that says, yeah, it's indeterminate what this val what what file this is going to point to. Excuse me. <clears throat> However, at the moment this DDR was run, it was pointed to this file. And this XML file is where you can find all the metadata about it. Because we don't have multi-file export yet, we don't have that disambiguation, which will cause serious problems in trying to do a whole system diff. Um, the people that I know who are running multi-file systems and using FM comparison are just cherry picking which individual files they run the comparisons on in multiple windows on really large screens and uh, managing it that way. It's the best we've got right now, but it's not as good as I would like it to get to. Um, I'm running out of time and I got a couple more things that I want to hit real quick slide wise. So let me get out of here and play this again. Okay. And Dave, just so you know, we, we are flexible on the end time on our okay. end. So um, if there continues to be questions or other things you want to show, there, there are no other presentations after yours. So. Um, oh, okay. I, I thought we had another presentation. Oh, I'm sorry, we do. Lynn Allen. I apologize. Lynn is presenting after. Sorry, sorry, Lynn. Didn't mean to uh, overlook you, but anyhow. Um, Lynn, I'm going to try very hard not to eat into your time. Um, two specific use cases for this that I really wanted to call out. One is regressions. So um, you got a system, it's in use, people are using it, you made an update, and all of a sudden something that was working isn't working anymore. And so you start getting lots and lots of bug reports. Um, in FileMaker, that's a real pain to chase down because it could be in a big complex portion of the system, five different scripts that are all calling each other. Some of them have lots of steps and trying to figure out what broke resulting in the weird behavior that your users are suddenly having. And it's code that you haven't substantively paid attention to in a really long time. With FM comparison, you can isolate, no, between last week and this week, only these 10 scripts changed. And of those, this one script is the only relevant one. And even though it's a 200 line script, I know that only these two lines of the script changed. So that's gotta be where the problem is. Massive speed increase for the ability to diagnose and repair regressions. Massive. Um, the other one, and this is slightly related to that confirming that no changes had occurred thing. More and more in the FileMaker world, we're getting used to dealing with this dev test prod kind of model for uh, promoting code or migrating code into production. And so I know these version numbers are kind of big. We'd normally be dealing with small decimals, but just as an example, prods version running version one, we're testing version two right now, and version three is in development. And so um, we're getting ready to push test into prod, but unbeknownst to us, somebody's been modifying prod directly. We don't know what they did. We're not even sure who they were. Heck, it might have been me last week and I just don't remember. I forgot that I did it. And so I think I can safely push test to prod, but I don't know for sure. I don't know at 100%. Um, and so when I pushed test to prod last time, when I pushed version 1.0 up, I grabbed the XML for it before anybody could make any modifications between test and prod. Heck, I could do that XML export from test before doing the push if I wanted to. But I got this version 1.0 XML, and now I can compare it to what's currently live on the server, and any changes will be highlighted. 
So if anything's been modified there, I'll know before I do the test to prod push. And I can confirm that those things exist in tests before I do the push. They can even be built into the test cycle or whatever like that. <clears throat> this isn't so much about tracking the changes or whatever like that. This is about confidence. This is being able to, to push the button in auto that says push test to prod and know you're not gonna break something beyond what the 2.0 changes are going to do. Um, I really like use cases that, that kind of give you peace of mind because I know that that's something I'm sorely lacking on a regular basis. So. I, I wanted to call this one out for everybody. The important lessons here, one, start generating and archiving slash retaining XML v2. Even if you're not ready to use FM comparison, it's gonna take you six months to get through the approval process to buy FM perception or whatever like that, start generating and saving that XML now. And it is automatable. We have a script step for save a copy as XML. So you can just write a script for your system, one button, you push it, all the XML goes out, goes into a particular folder, and then zip it. <clears throat> um, two big reasons for zipping this XML. One is FileMaker XML zips exceptionally well. You're looking at a 90 to 95% compression, which means you can fit 10 to 20 copies of the system in the same space that one chunk of that XML takes up uncompressed. And the other thing is that the zip helps protect it from transfer corruption. It's been a dozen or so times that I've had people come to me with corrupt XML and the XML got corrupted because it got moved across cloud-based systems while it was in its raw text form. And periodic, I've seen Dropbox do it, I've seen all sorts of systems do it where you dump the text into Google Drive or something like that. And through some weird chain of events, the encoding of that text gets ever so slightly changed somewhere along the line. If you zip it, that doesn't happen. If anything happens to that file while it's in cold storage, you won't be able to unzip it, which is better than getting something out that you can't trust. So zip these files for long-term storage and start thinking about your own use cases for when you would need to perform diffs. When being able to compare two versions of your system would be useful because it, it takes time to adapt your thinking to thinking about FileMaker in these terms. We're not used to thinking of FileMaker in the terms of running these comparisons, you know? 20 years ago, we went, well, we can't compare two versions, so we're just going to have to look. Um, and that's really just not the case anymore. And whatever tool you use, if you don't want to use FM comparison, you want to use a text-based diff, if that works for your process, great. I just want you to start thinking this way, whatever tool you use. Uh, shiny new discount code. Um, you can get 20% off of... Um, uh, FM perception, which will get you FM comparison. You want to dig into auto, whatever like that. Wow, that's an old slide. It still says Geist Interactive. Any proof Geist product. Um, I don't know exactly how long that's going to hang around. So don't, you know, do the trial for two weeks and then um, wait another month and then try and use the discount code. I can't guarantee it'll still be there. Um, there is a fully functional two week trial available, no credit card, no sign up stuff, just go download the app for FM comparison and FM perception. It's basically the same trial. So start it on one and your machine will just register for the other software on that machine. Give it a try, try it with your XML, try it with your stuff. If you run into any problems, please reach out to me. Uh, support at proofgeist.com is the best way to do it right now, or there are menu options inside the applications to generate support requests. Um, and just let us know. Um, it should work for you. So if it isn't working for you, that's a problem for me. And I want to solve that problem. Um, 
Questions? Let's see here. On a whole server full of files, can it tell me which files, if any, changed and how? Um, so you can do that at kind of a 50,000 foot way just by exporting that XML and then comparing the XML raw. So if there's any changes to that file, which unfortunately in a raw form will include um, uh, just making a record if there's serialization turned on on like a primary key, but it will tell you if any change occurred there. I don't know, whole server full of files. You might look at something that does batch diffing, um, just raw text diffing, if you're trying to get that 50,000 foot answer and look at something like Kaleidoscope or Bev, I don't know if you remember somebody else throwing out the name of another one at office hours last week. Um, another tool that could diff a folder full of files. Uh, I can't remember, but let me look real quick. Yeah, but there's, there's a couple out there. Um, it's also going to depend upon what platform you're on because they have a tendency to be fairly platform specific, but you could do that between the XML, which would give you a better answer than just looking at did the FileMaker files themselves change, especially since FileMaker files change basically every time you open them. Um, does a change that is automatic, like your example of a field name changing in a multi-file solution change the mod count? I want to say no, but I don't 100% know that for sure. That's an interesting one that I have to test. Um, yeah, too big a problem space. I, I don't know, unfortunately, everything about how these changes can occur. That might actually explain a couple of things if it does work that way, but I don't know for sure. Um, Bev tossed out that we do office hours every Thursday for FM perception and FM comparison. So at four o'clock Eastern every Thursday, we do a Zoom call and anybody who wants to can hop in. It's super casual, lots of questions we get definitely off the beaten path while we're doing it but it's a lot of fun so feel free to come by uh a google search well she's got the link there um but yeah so hey. I'll say hi yeah um uh, sort of a fundamental question um i had thought at the beginning when you started demoing this that uh this was sort of um You muted, Steve. Sorry, that was me. I accidentally muted you. <laughs> Continue. I, I heard this was sort of a, and then that was it. <laughs> yeah, it was genius the way I phrased that. I'll never be able to do it again. Um, <clears throat> when, Like in BB Edit, when you go to uh, compare two documents, that comparison is, uh, it's there, but it's kind of temporary and it doesn't get saved or anything like that. Um, and I was assuming at the very beginning that your tool works in a very similar way to that. Mm -hmm. And then we started getting to the idea of tracking multiple changes. I think it was when you said, you know, in this version, there are two changes in this version, there are five. So uh, change uh, three and four are a mystery. Um, if you, if you, you know, set something up to automatically export the XML on your files every night, and you've got all of these XML files, and you bring them all into this tool. Can this tool um, show you multiple histories at once instead of just before after columns? Can it does it does it hold these differences or are they is it just a temporary state of difference? It's a it's a temporary state of difference at least currently. Um, there's it, it's on the agenda somewhere along the line to be able to save a diff, but honestly, the the quantity of data that you need to dump in order to save a diff is humongous. Yeah. Um, that also may be an, a decent use for the export functionality if you wanted to retain multiple sets of diffs. Um, oh. But no, at this point, digging into a particular element across five or 50 different chunks of XML to see the history of that item 
is not something that FM Comparison can do. It is something that I've got on the list for a future version of FM Perception that uses the new XML. Um, Cause that feels to me a little bit more like a, an FM Perception thing is now that I've selected this one item, show me its history uh, rather mm. than, um, cause FM Comparison is this point in time to this point in time. It's just that that can produce some potentially erroneous data mm. um, that I wanted you to be aware of. Yeah. Because of the way those time slices happen. Um, any plans to revive the project update podcast? Not at this point. Joe and I periodically joke about it, but it hasn't happened. It was a podcast that I used to do with jo uh, Joe Simpson where we talk about what we were working on. If you really like the nitty gritty code stuff, there's some fun conversations in there particularly when I was getting into uh, parsing FileMaker calculations, um, which is a whole huge topic all its own that I'm not going to get into. Um, but we could at some point in office hours if you wanted to. Um, yeah. Cool. Anything else? I run a little over, so. <clears throat> no, that was great. Uh, really. Glad to see uh, how far the tool has come since you last uh, showed it to the group. And um, yeah, definitely looks like it's going to be a fantastic tool for, for developers to um, uh, help with their work. Awesome. Thank you all very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks to Claris for being such a great opening band. <laughs> well, well put. All right, uh, next up, Lynn has a tip and trick. I'm sorry for forgetting that we had added you to the agenda. <laughs> Nothing personal, I assure you. I'm um, used to it. Uh, okay, I'm going to share my desktop, make sure everyone can see it. Everyone? Yes. Okay, yes. so. All right, I introduce myself. I'm Lynn Allen. I'm honored to be a board member of FM Disk, and I've been a FileMaker user since the first time Claris was named Claris. Counted back, and it's 32 years. Oh my god, I'm old. Um, the case study I'm showing today is from a solution for CSU Long Beach. Long Beach is where I live. The program is called BUILD, B-U-I-L-D, all in caps. Don't ask me what it stands for. It's a, a program funded by the National Institutes of Health and designed to serve students who want to enter science or health research fields, specifically underserved populations. That was their outreach. Um, they have about 100 active students at any time, and they have at least that many um, what they call uh, faculty mentors. So these students work with professors to get through this program. The NIH has very specific reporting requirements for the institutions that take its funding. And so we got example spreadsheets of what they wanted. And when we were designing this thing, they it seems like everything they wanted to report on was called an outcome. An outcome is, it encompasses all sorts of different things like required classes, conferences attended, um, publications or graduate programs applied to. We'll see more of this as we go on. Um, the input is designed to be by teaching assistants, which is an ever-changing group of like advanced students. And we wanted the interface to be as self-explanatory as possible, designed for minimal to no training. And so there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes to try to ensure accurate data entry. Um, this is all designed to function in WebDirect. They didn't want these teaching assistants delving directly into the FileMaker. So what you see here is when they get in through WebDirect is much more closed down. 
but I can't demo it for you with it all closed down. So there's minimal menus, um, no status area, of course, everything is very well secured. So now I'm going to do, I do have another interface where all this stuff is done with portals because it's web direct. All these um, layouts are designed as list views with lots of finds behind the scenes as you move from one entity to another. So in order to get everything set up, we want to find a student. And okay, why is that down so low? Anyway, um, this looks better. We choose someone and we get their information. Now, this would be an actual picture here <laughs> if this were an actual student. And I can't show you an actual student because it's real data. Um, so we select a semester for which we are entering all these outcome entities. This whole thing is designed to show you how to present when you have we have up to 15 different kinds of entities that we're tracking here. How do we present that to the user so they don't have to choose? And we can just show them the specific fields for uh, the entities, which are all different, but still have to re be reported in the same place. When I was designing this, I was thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have to have a specific table for each one of these entities and then reporting on them is just going to be a nightmare. So this is the solution we came up with. You'll see that this view is sorted by the type of entity that we're entering. We can edit them. And this is really, really not what I had hoped for here, demo wise. Um, to let you see these things. And so that was required classes. You saw the fields came up. Conferences have different fields. So let's start this. And I want to point out this, there's this entry screen. The next screen is really where all the work is done. And then there's a third screen. This is all done on three screens. So when we go to the first screen, we're looking at required classes. Part of this scheme is to label each type of outcome with, uh, with a number, okay? As they're entered and created, they get a number. So to add a new required class, we select which class, which category it's in, we select one and then we submit it and there it is, okay? We can edit it or delete it after that. And we continue on and you'll notice at the top, there's a little red bar telling us where we're going. So research project has different um, fields. And then they can choose a mentor from the list of mentors. And this is the record that holds all of the field data. But there's a single field here that every single entity copies into. So if we go on, we can see stuff that was entered before. Um, presentations have a lot of data because they can have a lot of authors. So when you fill this out, um, obviously some of my tabbing needs to be fixed. And then you put in and these quote um, 
attributions. Okay, why is it not? Oh, I have to put in a title. Uh -huh. Okay, it takes it and puts it in a very specific order. Um, so, okay, so you're asking yourself, how am I doing this? You probably know. So all of these have the ability to add and edit all of these different things, degree completions. And then when you get to the end of the session of entry, you can review everything that's new. And it also pulls in the ones that already exist in the database when you start. So, because they, these, these items are held in the holding file and then pushed to active data after approval so that the um, teaching assistants don't mess up the data. So this is how we do it. I'm going to go into demo. Okay, menu. All right. This is okay. Come on, pop over. Swear to God. This pop over, and I think I. is actually a slide control, okay? Each control is named specifically. And then when the script brings it up, the entity that it knows it's going to go on, um, each stage has a, um, a variable that says this is the num this is the stage number you're at. And then it just goes, the script just goes to um, the right. If we the right slide. So all of these things are going into the same database. But depending on what you want different fields are visible without having to stack them. I've done things in the past where we stack them, obviously, and that's less than optimum trying to edit them. Um, so it's important on all of these things to have a consistent naming scheme so that when you go to them through the script, and let's, and if anybody cannot see this, please let me know. Um, so we, act, we go to the object by name and we just, No, it's not letting me expand it. Um, yeah. So we build the name of the of the object we're going to in the go to object calculation. So we just based on the item number of what that particular outcome is. Um, and it's the same for all the popovers, whether they're adding new data or editing existing data. Um, and then there's a script that depending on which kind of entity it is, which kind of outcome, uh, will take all of those the, the entered data and put it into the single field in the format that's required for that particular item. So that's the field that gets put into the NIH report. 
and and that's what they see. But the data is always held behind the scenes in these individual fields. So when we add this, we get degree type PhD, degree major, and submit it. Um, so does anyone have any questions? I'm curious what it looks like on, on WebDirect. Um, I don't have that set up for right now. It, it looks exactly the same, actually. Um, it really, except for not having the, um, the status area and stuff, it really looks exactly the same. I've tried to narrow things down so people only see the buttons they're allowed to, you know, that are appropriate at the time. Um, and it just keeps them in the area and doesn't let them get into private um, student information. So, okay. Well. All right, so does anyone have any questions that I can address? If not. Thank you all. Just, uh, I guess I have one personal question. You said you do you work for with CSU Long Beach? Yes, yes, with the particular build program. Yeah, you're, you're an in house developer. No, I'm an outside contractor. Um, and I have been for many, many years. I worked for various different um, smaller programs. With the, I worked for the um, council's office, the general council's office, and the uh, another program that manages uh, loan repayment for PhD students. So um, I've actually been there for a long time. <laughs> And they do have quite a few installed FileMaker programs, although many of them are aging. And, uh, but it was very popular at one time. They had all Macs, and then they changed over to all PCs. So yeah. it was one of the few programs that could make the shift. Right. Yeah, the, the reason I ask is I'm in-house developer over at San Jose State. OK, yep. So. All right. Thank you very much, Lynn. Appreciate that. And that's nice. going to wrap up the meeting for this month. We'll be back next month, as usual, on the second uh, Friday. Um, so look for an announcement for that meeting. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chair.